Time magazine called him the unsung hero behind the internet. CNN called him a father of the internet. President Bill Clinton called him one of the great minds of the information age. He has been voted history's greatest scientist of African descent. He is Philip M. Iguali. He's coming to Trinidad and Tobago to launch the 2008 Kwame Ture Lecture Series on Sunday, June 8th at the JFK Auditorium, Uwe St. Augustine, 5 p.m. The Emancipation Support Committee invites you to come and hear this inspirational mind address the theme, Crossing New Frontiers to Conquer Today's Challenges. This lecture is one you cannot afford to miss. Admission is free, so be there on Sunday, June 8, 5 p.m. at the JFK Auditorium, UE St. Augustine. very much. I'm Philip M. Aguale. The new supercomputer is the quintessential human invention. It is the very symbol of genius and inspiration. Inventing a supercomputer is about turning science fiction to non-fiction. Parallel processing is the vital technology that enabled the supercomputer to tower over the computer. Practical parallel processing was a new path that led to a new computer science and a new computational physics. Back in 1989, my discovery of practical parallel processing made the news headlines because it enabled us to see computers and supercomputers in a different way, namely as parallel processing or solving a million problems at once instead of solving only one problem at a time. Parallel processing is the crown jewel inside every supercomputer that enables it to solve grand challenge mathematical problems that will otherwise be impossible to solve. It's impossible for me to have solved the grand challenge problem of supercomputing and solved it across my new internet and solved it without correctly visualizing in advance how to mathematically solve it across that new internet. In the early 1990s, I was appointed as a distinguished visitor to academia and from the Computer Society of the IEEE. The IEEE is the acronym for the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. The IEEE is the world's largest technical society. The IEEE Distinguished Visitor Program sponsored quote-unquote top technology leaders and innovators and sponsors them to lecture at institute chapters and at university computer science departments in the United States, Canada, and Europe. An IEEE Distinguished Lecturer serves as a role model to its members and to up-and-coming scientists and engineers. As an IEEE Distinguished Lecturer, my goal was to explain how I discovered that massively parallel processing makes computers faster and makes supercomputers faster and will become the vital technology that will underpin every supercomputer. I asked a big question in supercomputing that had never been answered before. That overarching question was this. How do we parallel process across a new internet that is a new global network of 64 binary thousand computers? To quote myself from my lecture at the 1991 International Congress for Industrial Apply and Applied Mathematics, I explained that, quote, my experimental discovery 
of massively parallel processing occurred across a new internet and occurred on a storyboard, on a blackboard, and within a motherboard. And my eureka moment of the world's fastest supercomputer and computation occurred across my new global network of 64 binary thousand motherboards. I visualized my act of parallel processing across my new internet as a play in Broadway, New York, in which the production oil field was my stage, unquote. My supercomputing quest of the 1970s in Oregon, United States, and 1980s in New Mexico, United States, was to figure out how to solve partial differential equations that were defined within the interior of an initial boundary value problem of extreme scale mathematical and computational physics. My quest was to figure out how to solve those partial differential equations that were otherwise impossible to solve. Those partial differential equations we are impossible to solve on only one processor that was not a member of an ensemble of processors but possible to solve across millions upon millions of tightly coupled and identical processors that were equal distances apart and that computed in parallel. Each processor within that ensemble of processors operated its own operating system. Each processor had its own dedicated memory. Each processor shared nothing with nearest neighboring processors. And along that line of thought, I continued my research lecture on the nine partial differential equations that I invented and that I was presenting to research mathematicians that we are attending the 1991 International Congress for Industrial and Applied Mathematics. I continued as follows. The place, the Niger Delta oil producing field in southeastern Nigeria, the holes, one production well, for producing crude oil and natural gas, and two or three or four injection wells for injecting water into the oil field. The event, crude oil, natural gas, and injected water flowing along three mutually orthogonal spatial directions that we are mathematically named X, Y, and Z directions. The rules, some laws of physics, including the second law of motion that was discovered three centuries earlier. My new equations, a system of coupled nonlinear, time-dependent, three-dimensional, and state-of-the-art partial differential equations of modern calculus and extreme scale computational physics. That system of equations that I formulated for petroleum reservoir simulations included the nine partial differential equations that I invented to incorporate 36 partial derivative initial terms, which are calculus terms that represented the initial forces in the algebraic formula force equals mass times acceleration. My never before seen algebra, 24 million system of linear equations of algebra that was a world record in size in the 1980s. The supercomputing lesson that I learned was that in solving the grand challenge problem, 
there is a grand canyon of difference between physics and mathematics and computing. Solving the grand challenge problem of supercomputing demanded that the polymath must shift from disciplinary to multidisciplinary thinking and shift it up by two intellectual levels. That polymath must shift up from the laws of physics that were discovered three centuries ago to the laws of logic that were developed two centuries ago to the laws of numbers that were invented within the last century. In the early 1990s, in early 1990s lectures that I delivered as the distinguished speaker from the Computer Society of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers and from the Association for Computing Machinery, I said, the central processing unit of the computer reduces the infinite arithmetical calculations as defined on the blackboard and reduces it to the finite floating point arithmetical calculations as executed on each motherboard. The parallel, proce the parallel processing brain of my new internet it's my new global network of 2 raised to power 16 or 65,536 central processing units. I visualize those electronic brains of my new internet as positioned at the 2 raised to power 16 vertices of a cube in a 16-dimensional universe. I visualize those electronic brains as having a one vertex to one processor correspondence with the as many vertices of the cube in that 16-dimensional universe. The email wires of my new internet were 16 times 2 raised to power 16 or 1,048,576 bidirectional email wires. 32 email wires fed electronic messages that comprised of the initial and boundary conditions for my system of partial differential equations and fed those answers directly to each central processing unit. I visualized my emails as five subject-lined email messages, each synchronously sent to each of those 65,000 536 central processing units. I visualized my 65,536 synchronously sent three subject lined replies that I received from each of those 65,536 central processing units. As a research mathematician, of the 1980s in College Park, Maryland. My motivation for solving this grand challenge problem was this. I discovered 36 serious errors in the system of coupled, nonlinear, time dependent, and three dimensional and three phased partial differential equations of calculus that is used by Exxon Corporation mobile corporation and used in petroleum reservoir simulators and used to simulate multiple what-if scenarios of how to discover and recover otherwise elusive crude oil and natural gas. I am the research mathematician that was cover stories in top mathematics publications such as the June 1990 issue of the Siam News. The Siam News is written by research mathematicians for research mathematicians. I was cover stories because I discovered that the fundamental partial differential equations printed in the calculus textbooks that were used by the petroleum industry were erroneously formulated. The mathematical physics errors that 
we are that the temporal and the convective inertial forces that existed on the storyboard or inside the oil field, we are missing. Those errors corresponded to the 36 partial derivative terms of calculus that encoded them on the blackboard and algebraically coded them on, in the motherboard. That egregious mathematical error in turn meant that the sum of the three forces, namely pressure, viscous, and gravitational forces, within the petroleum reservoir simulator cannot be equal to the sum of the four actual physical forces, namely inertial, pressure, viscous, and gravitational forces that exist within the production oil field. Metaphorically speaking, petroleum reservoir simulators were built on sand, not on oil sand. And equations built on sand produces abstract verbiage and circles of errors. I discovered practical parallel processing and I did so at 8.15 in the morning of July 4, 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States. I discovered practical parallel processing when I figured out how to solve 65,000 536 or more grand challenge problems and how to solve them at once or in parallel instead of solving only one problem at a time or in sequence. My discovery of the parallel supercomputer that was highlighted in the June 20, 1990 issue of the Wall Street Journal changed the landscape for extreme scaled computational physicists and opened new doors for research mathematicians who must think in parallel and do many things at once instead of doing only one thing at a time. The massively parallel supercomputer offers research engineers and research meteorologists the opportunity to solve a million or even a billion initial boundary value problems at once instead of solving only one such problem at a time. My discovery of practical parallel processing opened the public's imagination on what the computer of tomorrow can do today. Eleven years after my discovery of practical parallel processing, my invention of a new supercomputer was reconfirmed by then U.S. President Bill Clinton and reconfirmed in this presidential lecture of August 26, 2000. That lecture of President Bill Clinton was delivered to the Nigerian parliament in Abuja, Nigeria. My contribution to mathematics is this. I discovered that the extreme scaled computational mathematician of the petroleum industry was seeking the correct solution for his incorrect equation. As, and as supercomputer programmers say, garbage in, garbage out. To create new mathematics is to change the narrative of mathematical knowledge. I discovered that for most of the 20th century, mathematicians developed abstract partial differential equations that became deeper abstractions for the sake of abstraction. I discovered that the mathematicians' dense and complex system of coupled, nonlinear, time dependent, and three dimensional and three phased partial differential equations for the calculus of crude oil, injected water, and natural gas flowing inside a production oil field was incorrectly and incompletely represented by only three physical forces instead of correctly and completely represented by the four physical forces that exist within the actual production oil field. That discovery 
was as unsettling as discovering a drawing of a dog with only three legs. It's true that mathematics is the language of God. But mathematical abstraction for the sake of abstraction does not equate to physical accuracy. Therefore, the inertial forces represented by the 36 partial derivative terms of the nine abstract partial differential equations that I invented must be present in every petroleum reservoir simulation. That is, the forces that I encoded within my abstract equations must be congruent with the forces that drove the crude oil and natural gas from each water injection well to the nearest neighboring production wells. In the early 1980s, I was outraged when I discovered that for a century and a half, mathematicians that claimed to have developed what should otherwise be their most important system of partial differential equations of calculus we are de facto contemplating their nevels and forgetting that mathematical physics should be a living body of knowledge that ensures that the arithmetic that encodes the algebra that encodes the laws of calculus that encodes the laws of physics are always congruent at each level and to each order i discovered that when simulating the flow of crude oil and natural gas flowing towards a production well, every oil company had the correct equation, the correct solution to an incorrect equation. In my research lecture that I delivered at the 1991 International Congress, for Industrial and Applied Mathematics that was the largest gathering of research mathematicians. I explained that research mathematicians simulating petroleum reservoirs for oil companies were as wrong as having the incorrect, solu the incorrect solution to the correct equation. As a research mathematician that came of age, in the late 1970s and early 1980s, I invented two types of equations. The first is a system of partial differential equations of calculus. The second is an extreme scale system of partial difference equations of algebra that arose from my finite difference discretization of my partial differential equations. Those two equations are different for the following reasons. The algebraic equates powers of unknown numbers. The differential equates the derivatives of unknown functions. For the past 300 and 30 years, calculus was the hottest, the richest, and the most important topic in mathematical research. Perhaps the most important application of algebra is the iconic equation F equals MOA that in turn is the mathematical shorthand for the engineering formula force equals mass times acceleration. F equals MOA is the central equation used by the petroleum industry to discover and recover otherwise elusive crude oil and natural gas that is buried one mile deep in an oil field the size of Lagos, Nigeria. F equals MOA is used to simulate how to drive crude oil and natural gas from water injection wells to oil and gas production wells. The partial differential equation is the most complex equation in mathematical physics and 
is the most recurring equation in both computational physics and advanced calculus. On the 4th of July, 1989, I discovered how to solve a discretized system of coupled, nonlinear, time dependent, three dimensional, three phase, and state of the art partial differential equations? I discovered how to solve the arising system of equations of algebra and discovered how to solve them across a new internet that is a new global network of 65,000. 536 commodity off-the-shelf processors that were tightly coupled to each other, that were identical to each other, and that shared nothing between each other. My processors corresponded to 2 raised to power 16, or 65,536 computers. I visualized those computers as equal distances apart. I visualize those computers as on the 15-dimensional hypersurface of a 16-dimensional hyperglobe within a 16-dimensional hyperspace. Mathematics is a living intellectual organism that grows with each research mathematician's contribution to that body of mathematical knowledge. To contribute to computational physics is to change the narrative of how processors are harnessed and used to execute extreme scale models that otherwise will be impossible. My contribution to extreme scale computational physics and advanced calculus is this. I discovered that the petroleum reservoir simulators that were used to recover otherwise elusive crude oil and natural gas encoded only three physical forces as their partial derivatives, namely pressure, depression, viscous and gravitational forces. Petroleum reservoir simulators should always encode all the four physical forces within all oil fields, namely the inertial, pressure, viscous, and gravitational forces. Those petroleum reservoir models that did not encode the temporal and convective inertial forces were nonsensical in the sense that the sum of their three forces is not equal to the sum of the four forces that drives the crude oil and natural gas out of the production oil fields. Prior to my discovery, the computations within each petroleum reservoir model that was used in the petroleum industry was as nonsensical as a four-engine aircraft that was flying all the time with only three of its four engines. The petroleum reservoir models of the 1950s through 70s were nonsensical because the sum of their forces was not equal to the product of their, of their total mass times the acceleration of the crude oil and natural gas that was set in motion and that was flowing from water injection wells to nearby crude oil and natural gas production wells. The petroleum reservoir models of the 1980s was nonsensical because the trillions upon trillions of algebraic equations that represented each petroleum reservoir were the fact to erroneously restating that F is not equal to MOA or erroneously restating that force is not equal to mass times acceleration, namely erroneously restating that the second law of motion of physics no longer holds inside production oil fields.
my contribution to large-scale algebra was that I discovered that those algebraic errors that occurred at the end of each of my parallel processed supercomputer circle of floating point arithmetical computations contradicted the second law of motion of physics. My contribution to calculus was that I discovered that critical error in the system of nine coupled nonlinear three dimensional, three phased, and time dependent partial differential equations that governs the flow of injected water, crude oil, and natural gas flowing across a production oil field. My contribution to petroleum geology was that I corrected that critical error and I corrected it not merely on one central processing unit but across my new global network of 65,536 central processing units that I programmed to solve 65,536 system of equations at once. My mathematical physics quest of the 1970s and 80s was for a more accurate way to encode the second law of motion of physics and to encode that law into the partial differential equation of calculus. I discretized those partial differential equations into the partial difference equations of algebra. I coded and message past those partial difference equations across my new internet that is a new global network of 64 binary thousand tightly coupled and identical processors that were equal distances apart. My contribution to extreme skilled computational physics was that I discovered how to solve the grand challenge problem of computational physics. I discovered how to solve the grand challenge problem and how to solve it across a new internet that emulates one new cohesive supercomputer that in turn parallel processes that grand challenge problem and do so across an ensemble of millions upon millions of commodity of the shelf processors. I did not conduct my research experiments to discover new laws of physics. I experimented to discover a new law of the massively parallel supercomputer that I believed will become the computer of tomorrow. My experiment made the news headlines because I defied the Amdahl's law of parallel processing that was formulated in April 1967 and that limits speed ups in parallel computing to a factor of 8. The supercomputer textbooks described Amdahl's law as the fundamental limit in the speed of parallel supercomputers that are now used to solve the toughest problems arising in physics and mathematics. I was in the news headlines shortly after my discovery of practical parallel processing. That discovery occurred on the 4th of July 1989 and occurred in Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States. The parallel supercomputer was first mentioned in print in 1958. In the three decades onward of 1958, solving the toughest problems by chopping them up into a million smaller problems and then parallel processing them across one million processors was science fiction and not computer science. And practical parallel processing was first formulated as science fiction back on February 1, 1922 or 67 years before it made the news headlines that I discovered it. 
At computer conferences of the 1960s, a hotly debated topic was this. Is parallel processing a huge waste of everybody's time? Back in April 1967, the American Federation of Information Processing Societies organized a debate between two supercomputer pioneers, namely Gene Amdahl and Daniel L. Slotnick. That supercomputer debate was titled, quote, The Best Approach to Large Computing Capability, a debate, unquote. Gene Amdahl defended the use of only one processor and defended sequential processing or computing only one thing at a time and defended that technology in his famous supercomputing paper that was published at the conference's proceedings and that was titled, quote, Validity of the Single Processor Approach to Achieving Large-Scale Computing Capabilities. Unquote. In a nutshell, Jin Amdahl argued that a grand challenge problem cannot be chopped up into thousands or millions or billions of smaller problems that can then be solved with a one-to-one -one correspondence with as many identical processes. On the opposing side, of that April 1967 supercomputer debate was Daniel L. Slotnick, who argued that up to 256 processors could be harnessed and argued in favor of parallel processing and did so in his scientific paper that was titled Unconventional Systems. That paper of Gene Amdahl was presented and published by the American Federation of Information Processing Societies. That paper was published in pages 477 through 481 of the Proceedings of the April 18-20, 1960 Joint Computer Conference that took place in Silicon Valley, California. Gene Amdahl won that supercomputer debate and his victory gave rise to the term Amdahl's Law. Amdahl's Law was often cited by the likes of Seymour Cray, the man that designed seven intense supercomputers of the 1980s. Amdahl's Law was cited to argue that fewer than eight processors should be incorporated within a parallel supercomputer after that debate, Amdahl's law became the two-word argument against the parallel supercomputer. After that debate of 1967, Amdahl's law became to computer science textbooks what the law of diminishing returns was to economics textbooks. Gene Amdahl's victory at that debate of 1967 was reaffirmed nine years later at a second debate at the National Computer Conference in New York City. That second debate was published in the June 14, 1976 issue of the Computer World magazine. It was published as an article that ridiculed, mocked, and rejected the massively parallel processing supercomputer. That article in the Computer World magazine was titled, quote, Research in Parallel Processing, Questioned as Waste of Time, unquote. Thirty-two years after that negative article appeared in the Computer World magazine, Steve Jobs also questioned the usefulness of research in parallel processing. Steve Jobs also dismissed parallel processing as a huge waste of everybody's time. On June 9, 2008, 
2000. Steve Jobs told the opening session of Apple's Worldwide Developers Conference in San Francisco, California, that his research computer scientists at his Apple Corporation questioned the importance of research in parallel processing. As reported in the June 10, 2008 issue of the New York Times, Steve Jobs told Apple's worldwide developers that, quote, the way the processor industry is going is to add more and more calls, but nobody knows how to program those things. Steve Jobs said, and Steve Jobs continued, I mean, two, yeah? Four, not really. Eight, forget it, unquote. July 4, 1989, the U.S. Independence Day was the day I changed the way I look at the computer. Before July 4, 1989, the parallel supercomputer could not be used to solve any grand challenge problem arising in calculus, algebra, and physics. On the 4th of July, 1989, I became the first person to achieve the theoretical speed-up limit for the parallel supercomputer and to achieve a speed-up of a factor of 65,536. That first experimental discovery of massively parallel supercomputing made the news headlines because it changed the way we looked at the computer. In its first three decades, parallel processing was used to solve embarrassingly parallel problems, such as calculating the sum of an array of numbers or finding the maximum value of an array of numbers, or multiplying two matrices, or finding the transpose of a matrix. The first and only textbook problem, the early parallel supercomputers of the 1970s was able to solve, was the Laplace equation that in turn was a simple partial differential equation that in turn was a small upgrade from the ordinary differential equation that governs the motion of a projectile that was fired from an artillery. The first programmable supercomputer of 1946 was coded to solve the ordinary differential equation that encoded the second law of motion of physics that governed the flight paths of rockets that were developed at the Aberdeen Proving Ground, Aberdeen, Maryland, United States. My first parallel processed supercomputer calculation that was the world's fastest that occurred on the 4th of July 1989 was coded to solve the system of coupled, nonlinear, time dependent, and three dimensional partial differential equations of calculus that also encoded the second law of motion of physics that governed the quote unquote flight paths of flowing fluids, such as the flowing air and moisture that flows above the surface of the earth, and the flowing crude oil natural gas, and injected water that flows one mile deep and below the surface of the earth and flows across a production oil field that is the size of a town. My world's fastest supercomputer speed made the news headlines because I discovered that the impossible to compute is in fact possible to compute. In a metaphorical sense, Jean Amdal was arguing that it will be impossible for nine women to have one baby in one month 
instead of in nine months. In my metaphorical sense, I discovered that nine women can have nine babies in nine months and have them if and only if they conceived those nine babies in parallel. Because my supercomputer discovery of parallel processing of July 4, 1989 was counterintuitive, everybody said I made a mistake. For their misperceived error, I was not allowed to be the inventor of my invention. I'm Philip Emma Aguale. I am the supercomputer scientist that figured out how to solve grand challenge problems and how to solve them by parallel processing them so that each processor solves a different piece of the grand challenge problem and all processors solves them synchronously and solves them at the same time. On the 4th of July, 1989, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States, I recorded an increase in supercomputer speed of a factor of 65,536. My speed increase made the news headlines as a world record. I recorded that speed increase across as many processors that we are simultaneously solving the grand challenge problem that I chopped up into as many problems into as many problems. And most importantly, my contribution to the development of the computer is this. I broke the perceived fundamental limit in supercomputer speeds that was known as Amber's law. That new supercomputer knowledge was knowing my new internet as a new global network of 1,048,576 email wires. I visualized one binary million email wires that tightly circumscribed the hypersurface of a hyperglobe within a 16-dimensional hyperspace. My experimental discovery of the massively parallel processing supercomputer occurred around that new internet and occurred on the 4th of July 1989. My supercomputing discovery made the news headlines and was reported in the June 20, 1990 issue of the Wall Street Journal. Eleven years later, my discovery of the fastest calculation across a new internet that is also a new virtual supercomputer was reconfirmed by then U.S. President Bill Clinton and reconfirmed in his presidential speech of August 26, 2000. Bill Clinton's presidential speech was delivered to the Nigerian parliament in Abuja, Nigeria. Thank you. Insightful and brilliant lecture. Insightful and brilliant lecture.